Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, it's working. Welcome to the second lecture in uh, advanced topics in quantum information theory and still doing quantum thermal, uh, which we will continue to do for the first five lectures. All right, so in summary from the first week, um, other than an introduction to quantum theory, what we, what we did was to consider the notion of the Gibbs state, uh, the notion of a temperature of a qubit, the temperature of a virtual qubit. And uh, what I ended last class with is considering um, the example of if you have a single system and you have a number of virtual qubits in them which have different virtual temperatures, then you can have interesting things happen when you consider the composition of these transitions. So the example I had was the, one of the first um, quantum thermal machines, although it might not have been called as such, the, the cuted maser. Also, by the way, the reason it's maser and not laser was because they were talking about emissions in the microwave um, spectrum. So that's why it's maser. Um, and yeah, in, in that case, if you manage to engineer within the QTRIT two of the transitions, two particular temperatures, and these are real temperatures modulated by external environments, such as laser or other environments, then you could get the third transition to have a temperature that was very much in your control. So the example that I had was if you manage to couple 0, 1 to a cold temperature and 0, 2 to a hot temperature, you could turn the um, 1, 2 transition into an inverted transition with more population in the excited state. Um, right. I actually should say that one of the ways that I find useful to consider the effect of, of such, um, such temperature couplings is to just draw a downward arrow on all of the cold transitions and an upward arrow on the hot transitions. Now, this is not entirely accurate because, remember, even if it's a hot temperature, as long as it's positive, it still means that there's more population in the lower state than the excited state because it's a positive temperature. But compared to the cold temperature, it has that effect. So in this sense, you see somehow that the effect of coupling this to a colder temperature than to that one is to somehow bias yourself to go from the level one to the level two. Let me write one and two. Yeah. OK. Um, right. So. Before I start with today's part, there was a good question at the end of last lecture, which I should address today. And the question was the following. In, in the last lecture, I talked about virtual qubits. And I insisted that when we consider virtual qubits, so if I had something like rho m m and rho n n here, and then there are various other elements in this density matrix. So this is a, a big density matrix. I insisted that everything in the same column and the same row as m and n should be 0. So, All right. And then I said, then we can consider the virtual qubit formed by energy level m and energy level n as long as everything else is 0. But however, I didn't somehow use the off-diagonal elements ever in the calculation. So the question was, well, why do we really need to insist these are zero? Why can I just say, well, I, I have the virtual qubit even if those are, are actually uh, numbers that are non-zero? And so the reason I gave last week, which is correct, is that when you do complicated unitary operations, these will affect the results that you get from the unitary operations. And this, uh, this reason still remains true. But there is another reason, which is that, in fact, when we study more about thermalization and about what this coupling that I've drawn here to thermal environments actually does, we see that it, it, it destroys those coherences. So in fact, it's not just that we have to assume that it's zero. It's that when we construct thermal machines by actually coupling two thermal environments, those off-diagonal elements will all become zero because of the couplings. And for those who have done QIT, the, the reason is actually is not very, is not very complicated. It's, it's just the process of decoherence by interacting with an external system. So for example, when you take the CNOT gate, and I start with, let's say I start with 0 plus 1 over square root of 2 tensored. So I will call this system. And now I'll call this 0 of the environment. Then what we get is the state 0, 0, system, environment, plus 1, 1, system, environment, by square root of 2. And now. 
If I ask the question, what is the state of the system before this? Well, I would say rho s is, if I write as a density matrix, 1 over 2, 1 over 2, 1 over 2, 1 over 2. But if I ask what the state of the system is here, rho s prime, this is now the trace, the partial trace of the whole density matrix of rho s e. And so this is going to be 1 over 2, 0, 0, 1 over 2. Because remember this now, I'm going to write rho s e here. is 1 over 2, 1 over 2, 1 over 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 over 2, 0, and 0. OK, so what I've done here is, um, well, what has happened is that the coherence between the system, which was initially just on the local Hilbert space of the system, has, because of this interaction, gone to the Hilbert space of both the system and the environment. So it's not that the coherence is destroyed. It's just that it's now only visible if you look at the joint state of the system and the environment. Now, you can imagine if instead of doing this one full rotation using one qubit from the environment, consider that I had 100 of these qubits. But instead of rotating fully so that I got you know, the, all of the coherence went onto the environment and the system together, I did a little bit of this rotation. So I split this unitary that I did here. I split it into like a 1,000 parts that would compose to be one big unitary. But instead of doing it on just this environment, I did it the first one on one uh, environment qubit. Then I threw that away and did it in the second, and I threw that away. So this is what I'm doing is I'm modeling a system that is interacting with a very big and disordered environment. Then what's going to happen is that all of this coherence is going to be spread onto a very, very delocalized system. And when I look at just the system, then all the coherence that I started with is going to eventually vanish. So this is something when we consider actual mathematical models for thermalization. We will do this in more detail. So you will actually look at the decay of the coherence in time as you do a normal thermal interaction. But the whole, all of this example is to say that the interaction with thermal environments take away the coherences of any of the levels that are connected to the thermal environments. So in fact, we should consider virtual qubits to be completely decohered, or at least qubit transitions that are coupled to thermal environments to be completely decohered. And as an example, in this case, if I have a Qtrit here, because 0 and 1 are connected to cold and 0 and 2 are connected to hot, it means that there is no level that is kept away from a thermal environment, which means that the effect of this coupling would be to get this Qtrit state into a completely diagonal state. There's going to be no off-diagonal elements left. All right. Are there any questions before we move on? Any doubts from the last lecture? All right, then, let's go on. Um, so I would like to do composition of virtual qubits, which, of course, involves the um, notion of tensor products. So just as a show of hands, uh, so how many students here have not taken the QIT course? You have not taken the QIT course, sorry. Um, but are you familiar with the concept of tensor products? Have you seen it? In, so you, but both of you have still seen it. OK, very good. So then. I'm not going to introduce it in detail. I'm going to introduce the main points that we will need for us in this course. Um, yes, so if I have two states, and I'm going to now consider the two qubits as an example. So I'm going to have rho s, and it's going to be given by some density matrix. So rows, uh, let's say rho s, 0, 0, rho s, 1, 1. Rho s zero one, rho s um, one zero, and then I have rho. Let's call it v. Rho zero zero v, rho one one v, rho zero one v, and rho one zero v. And I now simply take the tensor product of these. So the main thing is that in the tensor product. Um, the basis is just the product basis. So now I will simply get a 4 by 4 matrix, and each of the terms is going to be the product. So I can simply, um, since I put S and V in this order, it basically means that in each of these um, little matrices, blocks, I will have the corresponding element of S multiplied by the full matrix of V. So I will have here 
row S00 in all of them. multiplied by that one. So I'm sorry, this is going to become a bit small. Row 0, 1, V, row 1, 1, V. And so on and so forth. So I could, in fact, write this as row 0, sorry, row 1, 0 of S times row V, just the full matrix, and so on and so forth. Row 0, 1, S, row V, row 1, 1, S, OV, and so on and so forth. So that's TensorBurks for you. Um, and of course, the corresponding thing is to take the partial trace. Here, of course, if I took the partial trace of, and this is just a notation so that it's clear, if I take partial trace of row V, row S, tensor row V, I'm just going to get, of course, row S. So the, what you put in the partial trace is what you're taking out. OK, so that is tensor products. So I'm not going to use this part. Right. Um, so what I would like to do uh, briefly is to the same thing that we did last time on one system, but now to do it on two systems. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two um, qubits. I'm going to represent them as usual by the energy eigen basis. Actually, let's do it here. So this is one of them. Uh, and this is another. Okay. And so I have, so let's call this, this is E A, this is E B. Um, right. And now what I want to do is, so this is what I've drawn here is really the Hamiltonian H A and the Hamiltonian H B. But what I would like to draw now is the joint Hamiltonian. So the joint Hamiltonian, remember, is the sum of the individual Hamiltonians. Oops, sorry. So HA tensor identity on B plus identity on A tensor HB. And the way to use these energy level diagrams is each, each one of the pairs has its own energy level. So I'm going to have the energy level 0, 0. So if this is 0, 1 of A and this is 0 of B and 1 of B. 0, 0 is going to have its own level. 0, 1 is going to have the energy of EB. So it's right there. Then 1, 0 is going to have the energy of A. So it's right there. And then I have the sum. 1, 1 is going to have the energy of A plus that of B. And so it's going to be somewhere there. So it's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Now, without loss of generality, oh, I'm not going to write AB every time. It's too clear. Without loss of generality, I've taken A to be larger than B. If you switch it, we could just relabel it. But for the purpose of this demonstration, yeah, A is larger than B. So we know that this energy is EB, and this energy is EA, and so on. OK, so this is the Hamiltonian of the joint Hamiltonian of A and B. And now what I want to say is, well, do the same thing as last time. I consider that, in fact, I, I couple this to a thermal environment. Or I did something to bring this qubit into a particular temperature. So I'm going to say that this temperature here is beta uh, A. And yeah, let's do that. OK, I'm using blue and red, but it's not necessarily corresponding to hot and cold this time. And this temperature here is beta B. OK? Remember, what does this mean for the actual density matrices? It means that this qubit, rho A, is in a density matrix that is diagonal. And the off-diagonal elements have the ratio corresponding to beta A. So this will be 1 and e to the minus beta A EA with, of course, a 1 over, let's just call it ZA here, and, well, the partition function there, and 1 over ZB of 1, 0, 0, e to the minus beta B, EB. 
OK. And from this, I can actually already write down the joint density matrix, rho of AB, which is really rho A tensor B, is the following. I'm going to have 1, e to the minus beta B, EB, e to the minus beta A, EA, and e to the minus beta A, EA, um, minus beta B, EB, and just zeros everywhere else. So note the, the notation I'm using. I can put it here. Oh, oh that is already high. OK. This is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. OK. Good. So now, the question I want to do, uh, want to consider is, what are the virtual qubits on the composite system? Because we've joined two systems together, so we have now many more transitions. What are the virtual qubits there? And um, since there are four levels, there are six ways of picking just two of them. It's just combinatoric, so there are six virtual qubits here. However, some of them, a lot of them actually, are just the local virtual qubits. So if I take, for example, the virtual qubit, so let's say 0, 0, and 0, 1. So this is a pair of qubits, so 0, 0, and 0, 1. And I ask, what, is, what does this virtual qubit look like? Well, that means I'm taking these populations, 1 and, and e to the minus beta b, e, b. So the virtual, the, the Gibbs ratio here is going to be, so p, 0, 1 upon p, 0, 0 is equal to e to the minus beta b, e, b. Because that's that, divided by 1. Of course, both of them, oops. I should put 1 over za, actually, the partition function of the whole thing. Right. So that's, that's just e to the minus beta e, e b. And the energy of these two, e0, 1, minus e0, 0, 0, is just e b. Because a is not changing in state, it's just the energy of that one. So actually, this is we could have just written this as p1 of b upon p0 of b, and it would be the same because a is still the same. And so now if I say, well, what is the virtual temperature of this transition? So I say this uh, p01 by p00 is equal to e to the minus beta, and I will call this just, let's say, 0, 0, 0, 1 times the energy difference, e01 minus e00. So this is just the definition of the virtual temperature of any transition. The ratio of one state to the other, e to the minus that virtual temperature, energy minus the other one. But this is just going to give us now um, that beta 0, 0, 0, 1 is just going to be beta b. Because on, this, on the left-hand side, we just have e to the minus beta b, e b. And on the right-hand side, we have e to the minus this virtual temperature times, again, e b. So that's just beta b which is kind of clear because all we've done by looking at this transition is we've just looked at the, the qubit B, but just tensor product 0 of A. So you see that this one here is at beta B. We can do the same thing. This one here is also going to be at beta B. That's just the qubit B tensor 1 of A. And then we can do the same thing for two others. We can see that this one here is going to be beta A. And also, this one here is also going to be beta A. So in fact, there are only two non-trivial qubits left, which is from the bottom to the top, which is the sum of the two energies, and then the middle two levels, which is the difference of the two energies. Now, so let's look at um, the bottom to the top very quickly. So we have, I'm just going to write it now. So P11 upon P00 is equal to e to the minus, I'm just going to call this beta v plus, because it's the sum transition. And then we go e11 minus e00. And so here we get e to the minus beta b, uh, so beta, doesn't matter, but beta a e a minus beta b e b is equal to e to the minus beta v plus e a plus e b, the sum of the two energies. 
And the result then is if you take out the exponent and take out a full minus sign everywhere, we get beta v plus is going to be this beta a e a plus beta b e b upon e a plus e b. And I'm going to split that instead of writing it as a global denominator. I'm just going to write it in this fashion. Now, this is something we've already seen last time. It's a convex combination. e a upon e a plus e b and e b upon e a plus e b are just two numbers that sum up to one. They're like probabilities, which means that beta v plus is within the range again. So beta v plus is within beta a comma beta b. Right, so that is the, I would say, the less interesting um, virtual qubit to look at. The more interesting virtual qubit, of course, is the 0, 1 to 1, 0 virtual qubit. And for that, we get, so I'm going to write, so p, what is it, 1, 0 upon p, 0, 1 is equal to e to the minus beta v minus, I'm going to call this, e, 1, 0 minus e, 0, 1. And that is going to give us, so e to the minus beta a e a plus, uh, so let me write it fully maybe, so e to the plus beta b e b is equal to e to the minus beta v minus e a minus e b. which is, okay, I'm not writing there, which finally gives us that beta v minus is beta a e a minus beta b e b upon e a minus e b. Um, and everything we discussed for the case of the cutrit also goes there. I mean, the cutrit somehow is also present here. If, if I just ignore, if I just ignore this top level, this really the remaining structure looks like the cutrit that I talked about last time. So all of the considerations that I had there, they also go here. If I actually made this uh, beta a b cold and beta b be a hot temperature, so cold to hot, then this transition will look like a, a fridge. And again, you can think about it as blue is going down, red is going up. So I'm pumping population from the, the upper level in the middle to the lower level in the middle. If I inverted that and I made beta A hot and beta B cold, then I would be doing the opposite. And then this would become something which was even hotter than beta B. And if I made it, if I chose it strong enough, the, the, um, the sort of temperatures, then I could make it an inversion. So it would become a negative temperature in the middle. Okay. So yeah, so now what we've seen is how to compose virtual qubits. So now in, um, yeah, I think one of the, or two of the tutorial questions, or at least one of them, is going to take this further and consider more and more complicated compositions. Um, yes, question? Yes. Aha, uh -huh. okay, thank you. So just to repeat the question for those who are watching online, the question is why is the Hamiltonian of the system, uh, where did I write it? Yeah, why is the Hamiltonian HA tensor IB plus IA tensor HB and not something like you said HA tensor HB or something like that? Well, so um, so there, there, are two, there are two parts of writing this expression. So the first part is considering what to put in the tensor, and then the second part is how do you uh, get the energies together? So in answer to the second part of the question, energy is an additive quantity. So if I have the energy of one system and I have the energy of a second system, then the energy of the two systems together is the sum of the energies. So that's the reason why once we have one of the terms, the total energy is just the sum operator. Now as to why is it HA tensor identity B, it's essentially because, so you can think of this thought experiment. Imagine that I had, um, so if I have a system, a state psi of the system, then I say that in time t, it evolves as e to the minus i h of the system times t psi, right? So this is to say that the Hamiltonian of the system is psi. However, I can always say that 
I have the system with this Hamiltonian, but I can also write the description of just not just the system, but together with something else. So if I'm starting one particle, it doesn't, it shouldn't change the answer if I just include in the description another particle that's far away and not interacting with it. And so then I can say, well, what happens if I have psi s tensor psi e and I evolve it in time? Now the point is, I have to ask the question, what is the Hamiltonian on s acting when e is not interacting with s? And here you get the answer that if I consider that the environment is not interacting with s, let's consider the environment to have no Hamiltonian of its own. So he is equal to zero. Actually, no, I can't do that because then, yes, actually I can do that. He is equal to zero. Let's take the environment to have the Hamiltonian zero. Now I have to consider what is the Hamilton that's acting only on the system. And here you see it's basically if the Hamiltonian of the environment is zero, it means it's not changing. So the total, the Hamiltonian that corresponds to total energy must correspond somehow to the system evolving with nothing happening on the environment. And that is not, so that means that HSE is equal to HS tensor identity on the environment. Because now if you consider what is the, the exponent of this EHT, you actually get the correct answer. This is now just E to the minus I HS T what, and nothing happening on the environment. So this will become tensor identity on the environment when you evolve that. Whereas if you took HS product HE, then you would get actually zero, which doesn't make sense. Yeah. And I think this, this is a general um, uh, concept for many things. So for example, you can write a measurement on a quantum system, uh, quantum system with operations, and then you consider, well, what if I include another system in the description? How would I write the projectors of the measurement? You will essentially be the normal projectors on your system, and you just tensor the identity operator on the other one, because that corresponds to doing nothing. Yeah. Any other questions? No? So something that I forgot to say at the beginning of the lecture is uh, just to remind you that we are trying today this sort of a, a schedule that gives you a bit of a break in the middle, which means that I, um, instead of having a 15-minute break in the middle of my lecture, uh, I will have just about a five-minute break, the result of which will mean that the lecture will end earlier. It will end at about 11.20 rather than 11.30. And then in, for the tutorial, instead of starting at 11.45, uh, Nuria will start the tutorial at 11.55, so it's 10 minutes late, and she as well will have instead of a 15-minute break in hers, a five-minute break. So basically, we shorten the breaks within the lecture and the tutorial from 15 to five minutes, and by doing that, we give you a bigger gap in the middle. So it's from 11.20 to 11.55, essentially, you have a lunch break where um, you, can, yeah, you can go and get lunch if you like. Yeah. And yeah, so we see how this works, and then you can tell us about it um, after the lecture and tutorial, actually after the tutorial, or even email us or talk about it next week. And, um, because the alternate option was to compress everything, but that would make it a very intense lecture and tutorial, so I thought we would start with this one. Okay, so um, that means that I, I still have 15 minutes to go before the break. Very good. Now it's erase the board time. That's bad. All right, I'm going to keep that because I'm going to use that now. Um, so the next uh, thing to do is now to consider operations because so far everything that I've talked about really is about the static properties of states, which is sort of preparatory to, to making thermal machines and thermal protocols, but 
in order to actually complete the picture, we now have to add the operations. We have the states, we have the operations. And so the most simple one that I'm going to consider now is the qubit swap. And the idea for qubit swap is really, in, I want to swap the states of the two qubits. So I want to have, if I, if I have row A tensor rho B, oop, rho B, what I want to do is I want to go to rho B tensor rho A. This is, of course, not the most general. If I have rho A, B, I somehow, I basically want to flip the index to rho B, A. And I ask, how will I do this? And for qubits, it's actually very simple. In order to do this, all you have to do is to flip every state. So 0, 1 has to flip with 1, 0. In the general case, you would flip every state i, j with j, i. And this is very simple because, I mean, if, if, I want to, if I want it so that in all of the states, the index of a and b will flip, that's basically saying the same as if I have a state that's i, j, I need to become the state j, i, because that corresponds to flipping a and b. Um, so in general, it's a lot of uh, swaps, but for the qubit, it's just, it's really 0, 1, and 1, 0, which means then that the unitary for qubits is just the following, 1, 1, 1, 1. I'm flopping, flipping these two states. Um, yes. So this one you can do as e to the minus i h t, where h so is proportional. Let's say h is to be proportional to something that works like this. So you have zero, zero. And you have the two things in this subspace. Now, you have some freedom here because you, you basically want to rotate these two elements into one another. So all you have to do is to use the Pauli x or the Pauli y or any linear combination of these operators, and you'll be done. So in this here, this block here, you can use some combination, let's say, alpha Pauli x plus beta Pauli y in this in this sort of subspace. Remember the Pauli x operator, 0, 1, 1, 0, and the Pauli y operator, 0, minus i, i, 0. Okay. So this is the same as saying, so if you, if you remember the block sphere, um, if I have a Hamiltonian in x, then I will rotate in the yz plane. If I have a Hamiltonian in y, I will rotate in the xz plane. So basically, if I have a Hamiltonian somewhere in the x or xy plane, I will end up rotating z to minus z if I choose the time correctly. So corresponding to whatever coefficients alpha or beta I put here, I'll have to choose the time for one perfect rotation. But this is just to say how you would implement such a unitary. You could do it by simply having some rotation matrix in, in that plane. OK, so now consider that I do this unitary on the state that I just had here. So I have rho s tensor rho v. And in fact, I'm going to do it on decohered states. So I'm going to do u rho s tensor rho v, u dagger. But I'm, now I'm, I'm just going to take these as um, diagonal. So unlike the example that I had there, where I just put all of the terms in, I'm going to consider that there are no, no off-diagonal terms. So I'm going to take away all of these, which means that I'm taking away these as well. And I'm, only, I'm essentially going to only have four terms in the diagonal. So this is now going to give me the matrix rho 0, 0, s, rho 0, 0, v. And now, these two terms, so the effect on this is to, what's the blue? It's the blue. The effect of this unitary, so the swap unitary, is to rotate these two elements into one another. So in this whole thing, the second and the third element are going to rotate. So I'm going to have this be rho zero, zero. So actually, okay. So you know what? I'm I'm going to write down the matrix again because otherwise I will have to keep 
referring to that, and that's going to be messy. So let me just write down the matrix. So I have row system, tensor, row V. This is the initial state. And now I'm going to use the fact that I have populations, so I'm going to write it as P0S, P0V, P0S, P1V, P1S, P0V, and P1S, P1V. And then there's just zero everywhere else. Okay. And the effect of the unitary swap is to rotate, is to swap these two. And so I'm going to get now the same thing, but P0, P0, P1, P0, P0, P1, and P1, P1. SV, 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 SV. Right. Any question? Okay, now, um, the thing I would like to do is now see, well, S and V, if they started out as diagonal states, then they were, we could consider them as virtual qubits. So I can look at what the final virtual temperature of S is and what the final virtual temperature of V is. I've labeled this S and V particularly because I would like to keep referring to the first one as the system, which is of interest to us. And V is going to eventually become a virtual qubit, so it's going to be the machine that I design. So the most important thing for us to look at is what the um, change on S is. So now I ask this, the question, so what is beta um, V of S initially? So initially, I'm just going to, well, it's, it is P1 of S upon P0 of S. Um, so I, it's e to the minus beta V S. ES is defined as that, right? I don't know what P1 and P0S and P, uh, P1 and P0S are, but I just define it as that. And now I ask, well, what is the final state of rho? So, so this gives me now the trace over V of rho SV, which is the final state of S. Just a general notation. Usually, unless it's too complicated, the final state are just right with the prime as opposed to the initial state. So rho s and rho s prime, rho v and rho v prime. Okay, so this is now just going to be, well, the initial state of v, which is p0 v, p1 v, 0, 0. Because all that I've done here is just flip the states of s and v. So if I started with rho s tensor rho v, and now at the end I have rho v tensor rho s, although they're living in their sort of the other person's Hilbert space. Which means that now the final equation is going to be e to the minus beta v s prime e s because the Hamiltonian is still the same. I haven't changed the energy of the system or the or the virtual or uh, or of the of the other v is going to be now p one v upon p zero v, which remember is e to the minus beta v e v. Oh sorry, how did I do this? Eta S, let's say eta S prime. Since it's just the system, I don't need the additional thing. The prime again, just like for the system, the prime refers to the fact that the virtual temperature of the system has changed. Okay, which means that eta S prime is equal to beta V times EV upon ES. Okay. So all this is saying is that the virtual temperature of the system has changed, and it changes according to the ratio of the energy of V upon the energy of S. And this, you can immediately understand this by looking at the fact of, imagine that V and S were actually of the same energy. So I had two qubits, and they had the same energy. Then in that case here, the final a virtual temperature of S is just going to be the virtual temperature of V because V depends on both the populations and the energies. But if the energies are the same, then all that I will have done is have flipped the virtual temperatures. But if the energies are not the same, then in fact it's a bit more complicated. Another thing to see is that I can use this itself as somehow a thermal, a thermal machine of a very simple kind. Because if I want beta S to be very large, which would correspond to a cold state, I want to make beta S very large, then all I do is I make EV much larger than ES. Because I 
take beta v to be the to be multiplied by the product between ev and es and then that will be my final beta f so as an example consider yes uh -huh. um the, um, yeah, so the question was the partial trace. Uh, how do I do the partial trace in the matrix formalism? Right. So then, okay, let me do it there as I was about to raise. Or actually, maybe I use this one. Yes. So, okay, so what is the partial? So I can do this here now. So what is the partial trace over V of rho SV? Um, essentially, what it corresponds to is taking all of the diagonal elements of V. Um, okay, so let me, let me do it two ways. Graphically, it's the following. In every block, so every block of this matrix is an uh, element of S times the matrix V, right? And so the partial trace over V corresponds to taking the trace in every block. So basically, I can always write, if, if I choose it properly, I can always write any complicated tensor product as essentially... I can pick one of the systems to be the one that appears as the matrix times the elements of all of the others. So in this case, the way I've written it is the elements of S times the matrix V. So one element of X, S times V, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. And so here, the partial trace over V would just correspond to tracing the elements within every block. So this would give me... So in the first block here, I would trace... Um, I would sum up these two elements. These are the diagonal elements of V, and I would get rho 0, 0, s times rho 0, 0, v plus rho 1, 1, v. And I would do the same thing here. So this would be rho 1, 0, s, rho 0, 0, v plus rho 1, 1, v, and so on and so forth. Now, in this case, if v itself is a normalized density matrix, then of course rho 0, 0, v plus rho 1, 1, v are the sum of the diagonal elements of this normalized matrix, which is 1, and so this just becomes 1, 1, and so I get back S as it is before. As a more complicated example, because it's not written in such a form, if I said, let me trace out S of rho SV here, now it's a bit more complicated because what I have to do is, corresponding to every element of V, I have to sum up, sum up the elements of S. So what I would do now is, Imagine I want to consider this element here. So this is now going to be rho 0, 0, v. And it's going to multiply the trace corresponding to that one. And those elements are going to be this one, because here there is a rho 0, 0. It's going to be this one. So this element here is rho 0, 1, s, rho 0, 0, v. This one here is rho 1, 0, s, rho 0, 0, v. And here I'm going to have rho... 1, 1, S, rho 0, 0, V. So you see, I've taken all of the places in the density matrix that have rho 0, 0, V, and I get that is my submatrix. That is the state of S corresponding to rho 0, 0, V. And once again, now in this submatrix, I take the trace. So it's this element plus that element, which of course is rho 0, 0, S plus rho 1, 1, S. Right. So in summary, the... the um, the way you take the partial trace is by adding up all of the diagonal elements corresponding to the, the state that you are tracing out. Okay. So, in yes. Where? Here? On the other side, the yes, exactly. Yes, indeed. And, and this, is, this is exactly true. This is equal to rho v. But this is after the swap. So, sorry. So, just, just to be clear. Um, so, the question was, what do we end up in this case? So, if I don't do a swap, and I started with rho s tensor rho v, then if I trace out v, I get back rho s. If I trace out s, I'm going to get back rho v. But in this case, I did the swap, which means that S and V were flipped. So now if I, if I, traced, out the, um, if I traced out the V, I will get the state 
of initially that was on V because now it's on S. So I should say, I should clarify one thing. If I was to use full notation, I would try and differentiate between the state of V as in the numbers that form the matrix and the state of V as in on the Hilbert space of V. Because what has happened here is I can consider it to be the following. I think, let's, let me write it on a new board. Because what I've done is I've flipped two states in two Hilbert spaces. Let's put it like this. So I have Hilbert space A, and this is now the Hilbert space, so this is not the Hamiltonian, scrolly, and the Hilbert space B, okay? And I started with, so rho AB was equal to, and I'm not going to say, uh, I'm just going to write it as some term. So let's say lambda tensor um, eta. And these are now operators. So this is in the linear operators on HA. And this is in the linear operators on HB. Okay, but these, these, if I write it as matrix notation, are just numbers. So this is a matrix, and I call it lambda. This is another matrix called eta, and lambda is acting on the Hilbert space of A, and eta is acting on the Hilbert space of B. And then I did the swap. So what I'm going to get is that rho AB prime, the final state, is now eta tensor lambda, but now eta is acting on the Hilbert space, so linear operators on the Hilbert space of A, and lambda is acting, is a linear operator not H, Hilbert space of B. So what I've done is I've flipped, I flipped the states in the sense that I've flipped the matrices that were corresponding to A and B over. And, and that's a bit confusing here because when I write rho v here, this is why I didn't write rho s prime is equal to rho v because it's not, it, is, it is the matrix that was initially on v. But remember now it's in, this is the space, Hilbert space of s, not of v. So that's why I didn't want to write this one here because that would be abuse of notation essentially. Right. Yes? Yes. Ah, yes. So the question is, um, the usual way of doing it is to use hats for operators and non-hats for non-operators. Um, I guess I've, I'm just used to not writing it because the main operator we have in this course is really the Hamilton in H. And so then it's usually clear that it's, it's the Hamiltonian. I, I, can, I can make an effort to write hats, but um, usually it's not, a, it's not a problem because it's just, it's just the Hamiltonian and nothing else will share the, the letter H. So for example, I, I don't know whether in QIT you used H sometimes as entropies, but I will never use H as an entropy. H is only the Hamiltonian. So, right? Yeah? Yes? Yes. Yes. And there would be like a different basis matrix. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's right. Okay. So the question was just um, we we wrote it in such a way that S and V. Well, I, I didn't get it, but. The, the, the major point that came out of the question was that if we, we could also use a different basis representation where V was first and then it was S, and then, of course, in those blocks, each block would be the matrix of S times the element of V instead of the other way around. So, indeed, you, you could choose that basis as well. Um, okay, it's 10.34, actually, so I will pause here uh, for a five-minute break, and we will continue at 10.40 for the second part of the lecture. Good? All right. Check, yes, perfect. Okay, so for the rest of this lecture, we are going to do one thing, which is we are going to repeat what we just did, where we swapped to the state of two qubits. But instead of having two real qubits, what's gonna happen now is we're gonna have one real and one virtual qubit. So, and this is going to involve some math, but at the end we will see that, um, in fact, the way to understand it is quite simple, 
So all of the math simplifies, and we get a very nice picture at the end. So our Hamiltonians are going to be, we have one system, which is really just a qubit. So you have 0 and 1 on the system. So this is HS. And then you have a Hamiltonian of, that is attached. And now we don't know what this Hamiltonian is. It's some global Hamiltonian. All that we care about is these two states, which actually I can just write them as additional ones. So we have some state here that we will call i, and some state here that we will call j. And this is the Hamiltonian of v. Okay. Now, the reason that we do this is because um, eventually what we want is to construct thermal machines, which are going to consist of many systems, but not all of the systems and all of the levels will be interacting with one another. Instead, you will have particular subspaces of various systems interacting with each other, and that control is what allows us to manipulate temperatures uh, within the global, within sort of the machine and for the system. So what we have now is what we want to do is to couple the system to that virtual qubit, the qubit between i and j, and to nothing else. So I'm going to do the following unitary. My unitary is going to be the swapping between i and j. So it's going to look something like this. It's going to have a lot of ones. And then in some subspace, there is going to be, ah, this is going to, OK, sorry, this is going to become, so 1, dot, 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 0, dot, 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 1, dot, 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 1, dot, 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 0. And then there's going to be ones at the side. And these are exactly the elements. So this one here is, aha, uh, uh -huh. and yes, so 0, 0j, zero and 1i. OK, those are the two elements I'm going to swap. So effectively, this is to say I'm, I'm going to swap the two states, um, 0j and 1i. And in other words, if I write this down algebraically, it is going to look like the following unitary. I'm going to have um, 0j, 1i, plus 1i. 0j, and then I'm going to have identity on the rest. Okay, So in the subspace of 0j and 1i, I only have the 1, 1, 0, 0. So there's, then there's 0 on the diagonal and 1 on the off diagonals. But then in all of the other states, I just have the identity operator. So identity on the rest really means identity on everything other than the subspace 0j and 1i. OK? So in the case of qubits, um, this was exactly like, what is it? Yeah, there it was. It was 0, 1, 1, 0, plus 1, 0, 0, 1. And then you had identity on the rest, and the rest was the 0, 0, and the 1, 1 subspace where nothing was happening. So this is now the general case for your virtual qubit being a small virtual qubit in a, in a big system. OK. Right. Now, I'm going to write the states of the system. So rho s, this is the initial state, is as usual. It's going to be p1, oh, sorry, p0 s, p1 s, 0, 0. And the state of the virtual qubit, so this is now um, p0, 0, 0 s plus uh, p1. 1, 1, s. OK, and now I'm going to write v in the same manner. In this subspace, I have something. I'm going to have some, I'm going to call it p, p, j. Sorry, p, sorry. p, i, virtual, times i, i, v, plus p, j, virtual. J, 
J, V, and then I'm going to use the same trick here. I'm going to write row of the rest on V. And what does that mean? It means that in the, in the space of V, because I've assumed that I and J is a virtual qubit, all of the uh, off-diagonal elements involving I or J are going to be zero. The only two things that are there are the diagonal elements of I and J, and I write them down. The diagonal element corresponding to I is PI. The diagonal element corresponding to J is PJ. The rest are all zero, but all of the other levels, they, have, they can have whatever density matrix you like. It doesn't matter. It could, there could be coherences in those spaces. They're not going to matter to us. I just simply write this as rho V of the rest. Okay, and now one interesting quantity that will turn up later, which I can explain now, is the concept of the norm of the virtual qubit. And this is just PI plus PJ. Okay, it essentially corresponds to the probability that if I made an energy measurement, so remember everything is now in the energy eigenbasis as usual. If I made an energy measurement and I asked, what's the probability that this uh, system V the V system, is in the I or J state, so it's in that subspace. Well, it's the sum of these two probabilities, PI plus PJ. So as a consequence, I can say one thing already about this rho V on the rest. I can say that trace of rho V rest is equal to 1 minus PI V minus PJ V, which is 1 minus NV. And here I've simply used the fact that the trace of all of this is 1, so if I take the trace of all of this, I'm going to get PI plus PJ plus the trace of this one. So the trace of the rest is just 1 minus the norm. So with 1 minus the norm, we're not in the virtual qubit. And with the norm, we are in the virtual qubit. OK, so what is rho S tensor rho V? We now have four terms, well, five terms, but the fifth term is very simple. So now we just take the tensor product of these. We're going to have P0S, PIV, 0I, zero 0I, zero SV, plus, uh, yes, P0S, PJ, V, 0J, 0J, SV. Will I fit? I can try. P1s, P0, oops, sorry, PI, V, now we have 1i, 1i, SV, plus P1s, P, J, V, 1j, 1j, SV. And the final term, so now I'm going to also have this times rho V rest and this times rho V rest, but I can combine that. It's just rho S tensor rho V rest. Yes? Um, yeah, so no, so the question was, so uh, yeah, should the le levels I and J be um, non-degenerate? They do not have to be non-degenerate, no. Um, but if they, are non if they are degenerate, then some of the things become undefined, like the virtual temperature. But this is, this is still, it still is useful because sometimes you can be doing thermal machines or degenerate subspaces just to create biases between different populations. So yeah, it, it can be degenerate is fine. Um, okay. So that's our initial state, and now we will send that up. Oh, but maybe not the eraser. Need it. OK, and the next thing is to do is to really do that, um, the same swap as we had before, as represented by that unitary. And like in the qubit case, it's going to do something very simple. It's simply going to swap the two elements that we have picked to be switched. And it's going to leave everything else unchanged. Is this? Yes. Right. 
So the only thing that the, that the unitary is going to do is to swap these two elements, 0j and 1i, yes. So now I can write my final state, rho s v prime. So this is now the final state on s and v. It's just that state, but I flip those two elements. This is going to be, so rho 0 s, rho v s, 0 i, 0 i, s v, plus rho 0 s. Um, yeah, okay, let me do this this way. Rho j, no. I said I'll swap the elements, so I'll do it that way. V1, S, V, I, V, 0 j, 0 j, plus V, 0 s, V, j, V, 1 i, 1 i, S, V, S, V, plus V1 s, V, j, V, 1j, 1j, plus rho s, tensor, rho v, rest. Yeah. So because the unitary only works in that subspace, it really doesn't touch the rho v rest part, which is why I could write it as rho s tensor rho v rest. Yeah. Um, OK. So now the question is, what is the final state of rho s prime, so of, of the system? So what is rho s prime? This is now trace over V of rho S V prime. Okay. So once again, I'm going to sum up for every element corresponding to, um, I'm going to take basically every element corresponding to S. I'm going to sum up the diagonal elements on V. So how is it going to go? So this element, which is, with 0i, 0i, the ii I is a diagonal element, so it appears. So I'm going to have rho 0s, vs. Oops, sorry. What is this? i, v. What have I done? I apologize. iv. iv. And this is now just going to be 0, 0 of s. So the other way of doing the partial trace, so what I did before was graphical. But algebraically, all it corresponds to is in every, um, every element, everything that you're taking out. So here I'm taking the partial trace over V. If it's off diagonal in V, it disappears. If it's diagonal in V, it remains. So II on V remains, JJ on V remains. All of the terms that I've written here remain because, well, I, I, I started with a diagonal V, essentially. But if I had, for instance, the term, um, so 0, I, 1, J, the partial trace of this term if i was not equal to j, would just be 0, because it's a off diagonal element on v. So algebraically, that's the way you take the partial trace. All right, so I have this one. Then I have p1s, vi, v, 0, j, 0, j. So this is also 0, 0. Then I have p0s, vj, v, 1, 1. All of these terms survive. p1s. V J V one one. This is all in the system. And then finally I have rho S tensored because now the partial trace of this on V is just the partial trace because it's a tensor product on rho V rest. But this I've already calculated. This is just a number. It's one minus NV. Okay? And I can keep on simplifying this now. Zero S zero S. So it's um, yeah, so PIV times rho 0s plus oh, P0s, sorry, plus P1s, 0, 0, plus PJV, P0s plus P1s, 1, 1, plus 1 minus NV rho s. And these are just 1, so. S is a, is a real qubit, so that, that number is just one. So it's PIV, and now this is the final exp 
expression Tjv one one s plus one minus nv into rho s. Okay, so something is similar to the case of the qubit swap. What we've seen is that in the case of the qubit swap, what were the initial uh, elements on v became the final elements on s. And so we kind of see that here. We have the 0, 0 state of s with i from the virtual qubit and the 1, 1 state of s with j from the virtual qubit. But the big difference is that pi plus pj is not 1. This is not a normalized state on its own. Together with 1 minus nv rho s, it becomes a normalized state. So in fact, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a trick. I'm going to say, well, I can multiply and divide both of these quantities, pij, pij, pi plus pj, v, v, and then, so is equal to, and this is nv, so this is now just nv, nv, so I haven't changed the expression at all, but what I get at the end is nv times this state, piv upon piv plus pjv, 0, 0, s plus pj, which pjv upon pi plus pjv, 1, 1, s plus 1 minus nv, rho s. And this thing in brackets, I'm going to call tau v, which is the normalized state of the virtual qubit. Because what you see here now, by dividing by piv plus pjv, what I've done is I've made this state in the brackets a normalized state. Because now the sum of the two elements, the corresponding to 0 and 1, actually give you 1. So what this state is, is somehow, I know I have my system v, and I know that there's some probability of being in the virtual qubit. If I imagine that I eliminated the probability of being outside and just renormalized being in the virtual qubit so that it becomes a full actual real qubit state, that is the state I will get. And so at the end, what I say is that my final state of the system, with probability nv, it looks like it's the normalized state of my virtual qubit. And in probability 1 minus nv, it looks like nothing has happened on the system which kind of somehow makes sense because you can look at the state of V as being a mixture of being in the virtual qubit and not. If you were not in the virtual qubit, nothing would happen, so you would just end up with rho s. If you were in the virtual qubit, your state would actually be the normalized state, and then you would have a, a swap, a, full sw a swap like we did in the previous example where two real qubits swapped. Okay? So, yes, yeah, so you have nv, rho s, uh, sorry, tau v plus 1 minus nv, rho s. So any question? Okay, so, uh, right, another way of writing this, which is kind of nice, is to say the following. So this, this way is nice because you see it as a convex combination of either nothing happening or you're doing the full swap, but the other way is to say, well, let me take the difference, tau v, rho s minus tau v, or tau v minus, I think it's tau v minus rho s. Okay, I'm just gonna write lower. Tau v minus rho s prime is equal to what? So I take the state tau v minus the final state, and I'm going to get uh, one minus v, so it's going to be tau v minus nv tau v minus 1 minus nv rho s. So I've just now written tau v minus that. And this is now 1 minus nv times tau v minus rho s. Okay. So what you see is that the difference between the normalized state of the virtual qubit and the final state of the system is the same as the difference between the normalized state of the virtual qubit and the initial state of the system. It's just been decreased 
because you've multiplied it by 1 minus nd. So you have somehow, by doing this swap, you have decreased the distance from your state of your system to what the virtual qubit would look like if it was a normalized state. And here again, you can take the case, if you had a real qubit instead of a virtual qubit, like in the previous example, then nv would be 1, in which case this would be 0, and you'd have the distance between tau v and rho s prime is 0, and that makes sense because in the previous case, we just fully swapped. There was no, there was no probability of it failing or not swapping. All right. Any question on this? OK, so another thing to look at now is what happens to the energy of the system and V. Okay. So, right. so what I would like to know now is uh, I made this operation, but the energy of the entirety of S and V together might not have stayed the same during the operation. So what is the initial energy and what was the final energy? <coughs> and in order to do that, let me see if I can use a red marker. If I can find the red marker, there it is. So what are the energies of each of these um, states? Corresponding to 0 i, I have the energy 0 e0 0 of the system plus e i of the virtual qubit. Corresponding to this, I have e0 0 of the system plus e j of the virtual qubit, and so on and so forth. So e1 um, of the system plus e i of the virtual qubit, and e1 of the system plus e j of the virtual qubit. And then I have some energies here, but I'm not going to care so much because the, the main question for us is how the energy has changed. And so rho s tends to rho v rest is not, is not affected, so, so we don't care. OK, so the only thing that has happened really is that, I mean, even the first and the fourth term are irrelevant. It's just the middle two terms because that's the only place where the energy has changed. So if I write the initial energy, Ah, and when I say now E initial energy, I'm talking about the average energy. So I'm going to say E initial is equal to trace of, and this is the full expression, which I'll write once again for, for uh, reference, my uh, SV, identity V, plus identity on S, tensor H of V, times rho SV. So this would be the initial average energy of the system and V together. It's going to be a lot of terms. So uh, it's going to be many terms that do not change. But most importantly, I'm going to write down the two terms that we know are going to change. And those are those two terms. P0S PJV times the energy of that, which is E0S plus EJV. And then I have plus P1, P1s, Piv, P1s, plus Eiv. And then you have some more terms. So there are many terms, but I'm only going to write those two. Now remember what I've done here is I've used the, um, the trick of saying that the average energy is the same as the sum over the elements, the diagonal elements of the, that population times the energy of that energy level. So I've, I've basically used that form of the average energy. So I know I have to just take every one of the populations in the diagonal elements, or so every one of the populations, which are the diagonal elements, multiplied by their corresponding energy eigenvalue. OK, so that's E initial. OK, and let's go to the next board.
I never appreciated what, a, what an advantage on online teaching it is to just swipe the page and you have as many fresh boards as you like. OK, so that was the initial. And all the way over here, I'm now going to write E final. OK, and again, it's going to be the trace of the same Hamiltonian times rho SV prime. And once again, a lot of terms are going to be there. But the only ones that we care about are those two terms that have been flipped. So it's really going to be just the flip one. So it's rho 0 s rho jv, but now with e1s plus eiv, and then we're going to have plus rho 1s plus, uh, sorry, multiplied, uh, piv e0s plus ejv. And so our change in energy, which unless said differently, is always E final minus E initial is going to be, and now when we do this, let's say rho zero S P J V is going to be multiplied by E one S minus E zero S. So E1s minus E0s, and then I'm going to have Eiv minus Ejv. So that's this one. And then I'm going to have plus P1s, Piv, and then I'm just going to have the negative of that. So E0s minus E1s minus, oh sorry, plus Ejv minus. Wait, wait, wait. E1s plus EIV, yes. EJ minus EI. OK, so let's write this down. So now I'm going to relabel a few things. I'm just going to say, let me for simplicity call ES is E1s minus E0s, and EV is ejv minus eiv okay because i'm looking at these these are now the energy gaps the real energy gap and the, the gap of the virtual qubit that i that i uh, swapped with and so i have these two terms now e0s ejv minus p1s piv times uh, es minus EV. OK, right. Missing one thing from this calculation. Ah, yes, yes, OK. All right, and so the final thing to say is that Remember, I swapped these two populations. So I can also write this as a, let's say, delta. Um, actually, let me I'll write it down as delta PS, and then I will justify this. This is now E P0S, E1S, S minus EV. OK? And what I mean by delta PS? If I look at the initial and final states of my system, I see that the only thing, let me look at, for example, the population of, um, the, the, population of the system in the ground state. So if I just look at the, the initial and the final pop, uh, probability of my system being in the ground state, in the final state, it was the sum of these two terms. So I had P0, Pi, P1i, P1i. But in the initial state, remember, the only thing that happened because of the swap was that these two things flipped. So in the initial state, it was still this term, but it was added to this one. So in the initial state, I had this term, this third term, and of course, whatever came from the rest, but that didn't change. In the final state, I still had the first term, but now it was with this one. So essentially, the two terms that I flipped, these are, this is essentially the difference in population of my system in the ground state. And the negative of that is the difference in population of my system in the excited state. And so, what is interesting to see is that the change in energy is given by exactly that difference in population 
times the difference in energies. And this, as I said, the, there's a lot of math, but at the end is always a simple way of understanding it. It's kind of simple. We have two qubits of different energies, and then we use a swap to shift population from one to the other. And so the total energy that we spend or that we gain in it is going to be proportional to two things. It's going to be the energy difference that we swap across and the population that we actually end up changing. So that's, that's a sort of intuitive way of understanding this. Right. Okay. And so I have one final thing now to talk about. Sorry, are there any questions about the energy difference, average energy change? None? Okay. So the final thing to talk about now is repeating. So two things, resetting and repeat. Okay. Um, the disadvantage that I have with the virtual qubit swapping with my real qubit is that, as you saw, there is a probability that nothing happens, essentially. That my, my system, instead of being where I want it to be, is somewhere in between. So now I consider, well, what if I want to actually do something to, to actually get it there? And, and the point is that I can't always have my virtual qubit be a real qubit, because that, of course, is a trivial solution. If I swap with a real qubit, then I'm done. But if my real qubit, like in the case of the Qtrit maser and in the other case of two qubits together, is only one subsystem in a larger one, I cannot actually get there with one swap. So I have to repeat, essentially, this operation in order to get closer. Um, but I can't repeat it on the same system, because if I took all of the calculation I just did, and then I said, well, let me apply this unitary again, I would just reverse it. So the, unit, the swap unitary has the property that, of course, u squared is the identity. If I swap it and then I swap it back, I just get back with, to my initial state. So instead, what is going to happen is I'm going to need a reset. And the reset can be described in, in two ways. One is you, you just say you, you throw out V and get another. Or you reset the state of V back to its original. So reset V to initial state. Okay. In either case, the mathematics of this is, is very simple. I have let's say a state rho s v, and what it goes to is the following, trace over v of rho s v, tensor some tau v, which is the reset state. Okay, so both of these descriptions give you the same thing. So it's very easy to see how, this, how the first description gives you that. So if I have some state of the system s and v, and then I just throw out V. I just discard it into the environment. I know what to do then. I say the state that I'm left with on the system is just this one, trace over V of rho S V. And then I bring in another state, which, which I, I want to be in tau V from my environment, in the state that I want. So I'm just going to tensor that to what is left. So throw out V and bring back the desired state. Um, but you do not need to actually physically throw out V. You could also do this by coupling V to the environment in such a way that it resets. So one of the standard ways of of designing a thermal machine like this is to have your system, your virtual qubit or part, your virtual qubit subspace, and V is coupled to an environment, so the environment keeps on resetting it in between operations that it has on the system. Okay, so this is, this is my um, reset thing, and now what I can do is I can repeat everything before that I did. Okay, so I, I consider that I did one swap like this of S with V, and I always start V in so I say tau v here, but this is not the normalized state. So okay, let me let me just call this eta. But within eta is that subspace of my design, of the virtual qubit design. And so now I can ask the question, what happens if I do this two times, three times, four times? What will happen? And this is where using that formula comes in very handy. I can use the fact that every time I do a swap, I can see that the difference between the normalized state and the final state is the same as the initial, but just decreased. So now if I have rho s going to rho s prime, going to rho s double prime, so in, in between each of these, so this is a swap, and then there's a, repeat, uh, a reset, and same here, and so on and so forth. What can I do? Well, I can say rho, uh, I'll use that formula there, tau v minus rho s double prime, 
is equal to 1 minus nv tau v minus rho s prime. Because the second swap works just like the first. It just decreases the, the distance between the state and the normalized virtual qubit state. But this is now just 1 minus nv squared tau v minus rho s. And as a result, what I end up with is, should have left more space here. I'll just write it here. So tau v minus rho s. And now I'm going to write it with a superscript n. So this is the state after n swaps have been done. is just 1 minus nv to the n of tau v minus rho s. Okay. So again, the very simple way to understand this is every time you do the swap, the distance between your state and your virtual qubit state becomes smaller and smaller. And we see that because limit 1 minus nv to the n as n goes to infinity is equal to 0, as long as nv is not trivial. So if, if nv is, of course, 1, meaning that you are in the virtual qubit entirely, then, of course, you don't need repetitions. Your first uh, swap will do the trick. If nv is 0, like actually 0, which means that you're never in the virtual qubit, then, of course, doing the swap does nothing to you. And so, of course, you don't have it. But for any nv in between, you're going to have this limit be, be the case. So this is the way you some, come, can somehow, with a virtual qubit, get closer to the, the thermal qubit that you would like, uh, even if it is not a real one. Okay? And an important thing now to, to, to say, and the, the reason why I simplify the, the um, change in energy from the complicated uh, expression just to delta Ps of Es minus Ev, is that the same trick now works with repetitions of swaps. All I will do is I will have some delta Ps in the first swap, some delta Ps in the second swap, some delta Ps in the third swap, and so I can still write it as, so delta E with repetitions is just delta PS total times ES minus EV. So you don't have to do the math and complicate and add it for each swap. You just go, what was the initial to the final change? This works because I'm considering that EV remains the same. It's not like I'm bringing in a new virtual qubit with different temperatures and different energy gap. If I did that, then, of course, I would have to actually do it for each, each um, operation on its own. Um, yes, I will conclude here and take any questions that you have. Sorry, of different? Yes, well, different pairs, but the nice thing about delta PS total, of course, is that it's, you, you only need the final and the initial. So is equal to, I can say it is delta PS1 plus delta PS2, for example, but this is just P final on S minus P initial on S. That's all. So I don't need to keep track of the ones in between. So because it's just additive. So, it's, so I can say it as, so if I'm looking at the excited state population of S, is the excited state population of S in the fifth step minus the fourth plus the fourth minus the third, third minus second, but then all of the intermediate ones go away. So, yeah, I just need initial and final. All right. In that case, I will conclude. Thank you very much. And uh, so as a reminder, uh, we are ending 10 minutes early here, and at 11.55, your tutorial will start. So you have 34 minutes to, uh, to have lunch if you would like to have lunch now. Thank you.